pickaback plane is caught on the ground. A group of pickaback planes on the way toward the Allied lines are intercepted by P 51s of the 8th Air Force. The pickabacks are a combination of a Focke Wolf 190 fighter on top of a Junkers 88 twin engine bomber. The bomber is filled with high explosive and released near the target like a bomb. The Focke Wolf 190 controls the flight of both planes, each of which provides its own power. squadron discovers an enemy airfield covered with planes. The strike systematically destroys every single plane. Haven behind the 7th Army lines in eastern France. By the truckload, infantry troops bear down on their objective. A week of relaxation in a French town the troops have renamed Shangri-La. Prior to this temporary release from combat duty, most of these men had known only the shelter of a foxhole during 135 consecutive days of combat from the Riviera beachhead to the Rhine. The free modern hotels which make up the quarters at this rest camp are named for the infantry division's five winners of the Congressional Medal of Honor. Like at a church supper in the old frontier days, the GIs checked their rifles at the door. No more M1s for the rest of seven days. A tour of the grounds reveals all kinds of possibilities. For tired, aching muscles, there's a treatment any medic would endorse. A half hour's hot dunking in the sulfur water of a famous French spa. The clothing exchange where the vacationing GIs swap battle-worn gear for a brand new issue. Heavy outer garments, which cannot be exchanged, are laundered and returned at the end of the week. First on the schedule, a real bed. Sleep on a thick, soft mattress in a real bed ranks highest with rest camp visitors. There are definitely no gigs for getting up late in the morning. Being late for breakfast is no problem. A snack bar tides you over until the noon hour meal. The PX has everything. Day rooms are equipped with a customary variety of games. The Red Cross Lounge, for reading or just taking it easy, or daydreaming. Time for a show. Latest movies from Hollywood are shown. A one-horse open sleigh. A couple of days ago, they were at the front lugging field packs through the snow. Ski yawing, a tonic for battle weary minds. No mess kits, no field rations. Only music and French waitresses and steak and all the trimming.
Dances are held twice weekly with plenty of partners to go around. Almost to a man, they insist on maintaining contact with the war. After all, their buddies are still out there. Six days of rest, and then back to the front. It's not easy to go back after living country club style, but there's another batch of soldiers anxious to get a taste of it. So long, Shangri-La. It was great while it lasted. to the 21st Army Group's Northern Rhine crossings, Field Marshal Montgomery confers with Lieutenant General Simpson of the 9th Army and Major General Anderson, 16th Corps Commander. Extensive preparations and training precede the Anglo-American offensive. Bailey Bridge equipment, collapsible boats, rafts, pontons, all earmarked for a Rhine assault, are stacked up in a forest clearing. This bridging dump is maintained by Canadian units awaiting the signal to commence operations against the Reich River barrier. At Maastricht, Holland, LCMs brought down the canal from Antwerp are loaded onto M25 trailers for transportation to the bridgehead sector. American and British naval forces have chosen the LCM and LCVP as suited to Army requirements and capable of being transported overland. Alligators also are delivered for rehearsing troops of the 30th Division, 9th Army. The Meurs River is used for Army Navy training. Instead of operating craft of this type through waves and surf, seamen must learn to maneuver them to and from pinpoint landing spots in currents ranging from six to ten knots. Boats must be launched from muddy river banks instead of ships' davits. Preparations for the airborne operations coordinated with the amphibious assault. Elements of the first Allied Airborne Army drill in France ten days before Lieutenant General Brereton's aerial task forces converge on the Rhine. Twenty-fourth March. The actual crossing of the Rhine already is in full swing. Men of the 30th Division are taken over in LCVPs. General Simpson's forces make the southernmost crossing below Basel. Farther north, Lieutenant General Dempsey's British 2nd Army and Canadian troops are strengthening the bridgehead on the Westphalian Plain. Army engineers and Navy crews cooperate for these crossings. The engineers launch the craft and furnish guides, and the sailors operate them, applying lessons learned in weeks of practice. A jeep with ammunition trailer comes ashore, followed by reinforcements of all types for advance elements moving beyond the east bank of the Rhine. Operations are reported proceeding according to plan, with our troops well into the first German defensive positions north of the Ruhr. Glider landings near Brunnen, Germany, in the Vesel area on the Rhine's far bank. Coming in after Marshal Montgomery's columns have been launched across the Rhine, these units have the immediate objective of seizing high ground around Vesel. A junction with the American and British troops is made six hours after the airborne troops commence to land. To the south, the 4th Armored Division, spearheading General Patton's Rhine push, passes liberated forced laborers. The disorder of the German retreat is made evident by groups of Nazis giving themselves up without offering resistance. This dash by the 4th Armored precedes the final battle for the Tsar Moselle Rhine Triangle and 3rd Army crossings of the Rhine. The town of Weissenturm, Germany, is littered with equipment of every description, abandoned by the Nazis as they were backed up to the river. A preponderance of horses, dead and alive, adds to the scene of confusion. Disorder at the Rhine Bank, where Nazi stragglers wait to be moved to prisoner cages. 
The 4th Armored alone captures more than 4,000 prisoners in its drive through the West German hills. Meanwhile, 1st Army artillery shells the town of Hornigen, Germany, across the Rhine. This is in support of an infantry division moving along the east bank from the Remagen bridgehead, seven miles north. On 16th March, a treadway bridge is used by troops consolidating positions across the Rhine. General Hodge's army, driving for the central German plain, also employs Navy craft to move up reinforcements. LCVPs transport men of the 1st Infantry Division to Scheuren, Germany, northeast of Remagen. Sailors of Navy units attached to the 1st Army operate the craft. The Navy began operations in this area 48 hours after the Army's seizure of the Ludendorff Bridge. In addition, supplies are ferried across the Rhine in ducks. Two amphibious truck companies, one a Negro outfit, man the amphibious vehicles on the runs to and from Unkel, Germany. Prisoners of war and empty gasoline containers are carted by the ducks on their return trips. The Ludendorff Bridge across the Rhine at Raymarket. For 10 days it withstands aerial attacks and constant artillery fire while 1st Army troops exploit the initial breaching of the Rhine River line. Traffic in the face of the attacks must be kept to proper intervals between vehicles. A convoy of Patton equipment is ready to be unloaded for engineer battalions who begin construction despite the enemy raids. Normally a 34-hour job, the bridging operations are hours behind as Nazi fire flares up repeatedly. Under heavy enemy fire, combat engineers out on the incompleted span dash back to shore. Despite these attacks, the first Ponton Bridge is completed and handling heavy traffic on 14th March. Armor is raced across the new link as the Remagen Bridgehead begins expanding into a wide front. Both the Ponton Span and the adjacent Ludendorff Bridge are still under enemy fire. The engineer battalion working on the Ludendorff strengthens the roadbed, which was improvised to allow vehicles to travel over the railway ties. Damaged structural members of the bridge are removed by engineers. But weakened by the cumulative damage, the Ludendorff collapses on 17th March while about 300 engineer troops are working on it. Many of them are hurled into the swift icy water or crushed by the falling structure. Rescue crews saved those who managed to cling to sections of the span as it gave way. Rescuers swim out into the Rhine to reach injured men kept afloat by driftwood. bringing out a line to pull in the surviving engineers. Quick action of this type saves many lives. When the 512-foot center span of the Ludendorff gave way, there was no vehicular traffic crossing the bridge. Crews extricate bodies pinned beneath the heavy beams. Three days later, on 20th March, Supreme Headquarters announces that the collapsed Ludendorff Bridge has been abandoned. The dispatch says that the span is no longer necessary because of the existence of other facilities across the Rhine into the Remagen Bridgehead.
RAF films of the jet-propelled Gloucester Meteor, British counterpart of the American jet plane, the P-80 Shooting Star. The Meteor, powered by two Rolls-Royce engines, was first used to combat Nazi robot bombs. Although still in the early stages of experimentation, the plane has proved to be faster than the 500-mile-an-hour buzz bombs. Smooth running, easy to fly, and practically noiseless, the Meteor leaves almost no trail of smoke. Known as the squirt by RAF pilots, the plane climbs like an elevator and increases its speed in high altitudes. component of the M69 bomb, a cheesecloth sock containing specially processed jellied gasoline. When ignited, the gel filling becomes a clinging fiery mass spreading more than a yard in diameter. It burns at approximately 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit for eight to 10 minutes. The bomb was developed by the National Defense Research Council in collaboration with the Chemical Warfare Service. In a demonstration, it is fired electrically from the ground against a wall. For airdrops, the M69 is assembled in groups of 38. The E23 adapter is used in forming 500-pound aimable clusters carried by planes equipped to handle this size bomb. On the assembly line at Mays Landing, New Jersey, the bombs are secured inside the cylindrical halves of the cluster wall. The bomb is held together by nine steel straps attached to release buckles, which are broken open by time fuses within the fin assembly. The clusters are given high and low altitude tests at Edgewood Arsenal with a B-25 loading the 500 pounders. The cluster is released and opened and the individual bombs with gauze streamers trailing drop toward the target. an M1 fuse detonates the ejection charge, which ignites and hurls the gel filling from the tail of the bomb. Another drop of the jellied gasoline bombs. The M69 saw extensive use in the March fire raids on Tokyo and Nagoya. Also, the M47, containing about the same type incendiary material, but packaged as a 100-pound unit. American-trained Chinese First Army troops drive on Lashio. Bulldozers clear the way for tanks and infantry advancing on the ancient city, main terminus of the Burma Road. The Nam Yao River is crossed at the site of a blown out railroad bridge about two miles from the city. Lashio, prior to the main attack, bombed and gutted by planes of the 10th Air Force. Strategic importance of Lashio is its railway facilities connecting it with Mandalay and other Burma cities. Troops of the Chinese First Army occupy Lashio and its adjoining airstrip, 7th March. The Japanese offered only slight resistance before withdrawing. A captured Japanese machine gun, one of the many weapons abandoned by the enemy in his hasty retreat. Thousands of gasoline drums are strewn over the airstrip. Negro troops of an anti-aircraft battalion quickly set up their guns along the captured runway. Enemy pillboxes built near the field are constructed with three separate compartments for greater protection against shell hits. Wreckage of old Japanese and American planes and engines found in many of the 102 revetments along the airstrip. 
This dummy was painted and then placed near the edge of the airfield to draw fire from our strafing and bombing planes. A railroad engine, cleverly hidden and camouflaged by the Japs. Lieutenant General Daniel I. Sultan and Chinese commanders at Lashio Railroad Yard. In a pincer movement, coordinated with the Chinese First Army drive on Lashio, British troops advance on Mandalay. Abandoned railroad cars of the important mandalay Lashio Railway. Sikhs, Punjabis and Gurkhas of a predominantly Indian division strike toward the city in heat which exceeds 130 degrees. A wounded Jap, one of the few captured alive in the British advance. The Jap garrison is under attack from north, south, east, and west. Mandalay Hill, a Buddhist holy spot and used by the Japs as a key observation post, is brought under artillery and tank fire. After capture of the hill, British and Indian troops with tank support move up for an attack on Fort Dufferin in the heart of the city. Frontal attack fails to break through the walls and moat surrounding Fort Dufferin. British big guns are brought up to breach the 30-foot walls, which are blasted with 100-pound shells from 4.5-inch howitzers. A battalion supported by tanks firing point-blank at the main gate smashes against the fortifications. Japs hold up and barricaded behind the wall drive the attackers back with machine gun fire. Several of our tanks are knocked out in the action. Flanking movements feel out weak points in enemy positions. The last remaining center of Jap resistance in Mandalay, the fort is fanatically defended in a 12-day siege. Fall of Fort Dufferin and Mandalay takes place 20th March after almost three years of Japanese occupation. the initial beachhead from Mount Suribachi. D-Day plus five, shelling the ridge bordering the number two airstrip. Tanks close in on the Japs dug in the caves along the ridge. mortar crews is knocked out. All except one Marine are killed. The ridge protecting the airstrip is stubbornly defended. A tank flamethrower goes into action against one of the many pillboxes covering the ridge. demolition crew placing charges at the entrance of a blockhouse. Rocket launcher mounted on a truck in action against Jap positions along the ridge. Troops sweep across the plateau above the airstrip. Heavy mortar and rifle fire blocks the approaches to the field and the slight gains are made at heavy cost in lives. Jap trenches along the ridge remain the last obstacle before the airstrip. Seizure of the ridge puts the airstrip and surrounding enemy positions under direct fire of our guns. Two airstrip passes some of our damaged vehicles. Air Corps films of Iwo Jima from a C-47 bringing in supplies from Saipan. Circling Mount Suribachi for a landing on airstrip number one. Four more C-47s follow the first one in. Each plane carries 13 packs containing 17 mortar shells. The 
first P-51 lands on airstrip number one. P-51s on EO, fighter support for B-29s attacking the Japanese mainland. Navy films of a carrier strike at the Ryukyu Islands, 360 miles south of Japan. Aircraft carriers, battleships, cruisers, and other units of Admiral Raymond A. Spruance's powerful 5th Fleet battle through heavy seas. They penetrate deep into territory considered by the enemy as part of the Japanese mainland. Hundreds of bombers and fighters take off from the decks of the task force carriers. A protective umbrella of Hellcats and Corsairs is thrown around the fleet, while Avenger torpedo planes and Helldiver bombers sweep inland. Coastal ships are caught offshore and destroyed. Jap warships and cargo vessels anchored in the island harbor and breakwater are strafed and sunk. Military and naval installations along the shore are pounded by the Navy's HE rockets and 50 caliber guns. The island's big airstrip is raked by heavy fire. destroyed on the ground. Back at the fleet, Jap aircraft strike at our ships. The few remaining Jap planes that get through our fighter cordon run into intense anti-aircraft fire. Invasion of Okinawa Island by the 10th Army on 1st April. <laughs> 